Aye, kuwe kuwe madue. Aye, kuwe kuwe madue. Aye. Could you please state your name? My name is Kweli Tutashinda. Great. Well, Baba Kweli, thank you so much for being a part of this uh, oral history project uh, with the Brotherhood of Elders Network. We're really excited to have you today, and I'm just you know, very excited to hear what you have to say. So, thank you. Yep. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so let's, uh, let's get started. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Okay. I was born in a little town called Wynn, Arkansas, a population of about 7,500 people, right next to my mother's hometown of Forest City, which is probably a little bigger. Both of those little cities are approximately 30 to 35 miles west of Memphis, Tennessee. So for that area, Memphis is the main hub. I grew up primarily in Pine Bluff, though, where my grandparents lived and uh, had been residing, particularly my grandfather, and uh, even great-grandfather since 1863. Wow. Uh, so what was it like growing up there? Well, I, grew, I was born in 1956, so mm -hmm. I grew up under Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. And uh, being in the South, I'm part of the last generation of children that grew up under Jim Crow segregation and remember it. There's, mm -hmm. you know, the kids four or five years younger than myself also grew up under it but they don't remember it. And so up until 1970, in varying degrees, our town was still segregated, wow. meaning uh, you got on the back of the bus, you had separate waiting rooms for doctors, for instance, I had asthma severely, so I had uh, an allergy specialist that had separate waiting rooms for black and white. Uh, I remember distinctly going up to the balcony in the movie theaters. We couldn't sit down at the bottom. <coughs> Excuse me. But at the same time, I grew up in a historically, a town with a historically black college, Arkansas a and College, and there was a black majority. So the main cultural events in my hometown were black. And so from my perspective, we didn't lack for anything. Most of the educated black people in Arkansas at that time had been educated in my hometown. And my grandfather had been part of the second generation to finish there uh, back in 1894. And so um, I had the best that it could be given the circumstances. Um, so you're talking about uh, growing up and just the, the fact that it was majority black and your experiences around that were very black and having a, a, like HBCU there as well has kind of fostered a lot with your development. That's what you're, I think you're saying something like that? Correct, for sure. Okay, excellent. And how long did you end up staying um, in your town and did you leave once you became an adult or you stayed a little bit longer? Or? Well, all of that. Okay. I stayed there until I finished high school at 18 and then um, I went away, I went out of state to school at first, uh, Fisk University, um, my first two years. And then I transferred back in t and finished up at the uh, main university up in Fayetteville. And after that, I came back home for about nine months. And in 1979, I left basically for good. So I've been gone for approximately over 42 years. Uh, but it feels more like 45. Because <clears throat> when you go to college, you know, you kind of, it broadens your horizons, particularly if you are able to go out of state, which was kind of, um, for lack of a better word, an elite experience in my hometown. Not many of my classmates were able to go out of state to college. As you know, it costs a lot more. Mm -hmm. And Fisk at that time was very expensive, you know, the equivalent of a Stanford or a Harvard. But it was an enriching experience. And um, the thing about Fisk that was so inspiring was the, first off, the number of historical figures that had gone there. So in your first week of school, they do almost kind of like a propaganda campaign because they take you, each day you have an assembly in Jubilee Hall, which is the oldest building on campus. Mm -hmm. And I will add, the money to build that building was raised by the Fisk Jubilee Singers, which were the mm -hmm. first 
group to travel internationally uh, spreading black culture back in the 1860s and 1870s. Wow. They raised money all throughout Europe for Fisk University and put Fisk and black colleges on the map. In fact, the Fisk Jubilee Singers were so elite, I've never seen them. They didn't even perform for students. The Black Mass Choir, and they were like four other levels of choirs that sang for the students. They performed, and when they performed, you knew when they were performing because all these rich people came up on campus, you know. Um, so anyway, we would be ushered into Jubilee Hall and giving these rousing lectures of all the incredible people who had been there, particularly W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois Hall was right next to the dormitory where I stayed in. But then you had all these teachers that were already there still. C. Eric Lincoln, who wrote the first um, pivotal book on black Muslims, taught philosophy. Uh, Alex Swan was one of the first ones to approach and develop classes on black sociology, was one of our professors. Uh, Philip Reeker was a part of the black arts movement. You know, you look up any given day, uh, Muhammad Ali or James Brown or Jim Brown just walking through the campus, you know. So uh, it was that type of just enriching cultural experience that added on to what I had grown up with that kind of uh, ushered me into, you know, kind of a political transformation, which I went through a little bit after that. Oh, interesting. And what was that political transformation for you? Well, upon transferring to University of Arkansas, one of the things that immediately was made aware to me was that, first off, black students up there were an acute minority. So I went from an all-black college where you knew almost everybody on the campus and had to speak to everybody every day to being a part of like a small little group of 200 essentially kind of scared black people amidst 15,000 white people in, I must add, the most racist part of the state. Now, the city of Fayetteville, Arkansas itself, traditionally has been liberal. But right outside of that are what you would call, or they call actually, hillbillies who don't like anybody who's not really from that area. So you had this real interesting um, conundrum, so to speak, of different forces up there. And it became immediately aware to me like, oh, they're really doing their thing. And that's not my thing. And so it threw me back on like, well, what is your thing? And it just so happened to coincide with a cousin who was in law school at the same time. And then there was a brother, Tartibu Marifa, and his wife, Uhai, who had just come back from Tanzania and were former Black Panthers. And then there were several other older individuals, a brother named Otis Hawkins, who had been in the Urban League and came back to law school, who had formed a nucleus and had kind of like, not a group, an organization, but they got together and they practiced Kwanzaa and different cultural things. They had changed their names. And my cousin gave me basically two books one weekend, uh, 1976. One was From Plan to Planet by Haki Mahabuti. And the other one was Cooking with Mother Nature by Dick Gregory. And I read these books over the Thanksgiving holiday. And by January, I had changed my name, diet, and major. And um, I was already pre-med and had taken and finished my pre-med requirements already. So I kind of knew that if I still wanted to go to medical school, I could. But I, I wanted to study something that was more fulfilling. And I thought give me a little bit more uh, <clears throat> what connection to the things that I was studying already. I'd studied, started studying yoga and meditation and Tai Chi. And I was already a martial artist. So coupled with the black consciousness, philosophy allowed me room basically to finish college. Because in many ways, I was frustrated. Gotcha. Um, and um, I settled in on that and then um, became a student leader in college and um, changed my name, of course, like I said. And it was tumultuous, because you can imagine, you know, I'm from largely, for the most part, a middle class family who had mm -hmm. staked 
its hopes and dreams on our generation kind of upping the ante, whereas our parents and grandparents had been teachers, they had expected us to be in the professions of either law or medicine. And generally speaking, black boys of my generation that were encouraged to get, go for it, those were the two professions we were encouraged. You know, it wasn't athletics, but it also wasn't computer science or engineering. Mm -hmm. It was either medicine or law. And I was basically positioned to do either one of those, but my mother was a biology professor for a long time at Spelman College, mm -hmm. so I had already been oriented toward the sciences, even in high school, you know, and had been on that lonely trek of being like the, the often the lone black kid in the science class, like the only kid out of, what, 350 black students in my senior class to take physics. Just two of us took chemistry. Just five of us took calculus. Mm. And, and that's some of the harm done by integration, to be quite honest, because when we had all those black college, high schools, you had classes full of black kids in physics and chemistry and all those courses. <clears throat> but in some of the white schools after integration, there was a weeding out process. So I'm a part of that first really generation that had the option to go to say Harvard, Yale, and Duke. I was courted heavily by Duke. But for most of us, Fisk, Morehouse, Hampton, Howard were our Ivy League schools. So I felt when I was at Fisk, the ever, the actual equivalent of any student that was at Vanderbilt, say for instance, the white Southern Ivy League school across town. And see, we had an exchange program with them. So um, college provided a tremendous transformation, but at the same time, family upheaval. And I went back home to settle in and, and uh, took it from there. Excellent. Wow. And who or what influenced you the most as a child? Well, it's layered. Um, I guess in the house, you know, obviously my parents, you know, um, and I also live with my grandparents. So if you live with your grandparents, generally your grandparents are kind of like in charge. So my grandfather was the towering figure in our family. You know, he'd been born in 1870. And um, he was already 86 when I was born and still had all of his faculties. And he had been a teacher for over 55 years and a minister. And even though he was nearly three-fourths white, and when I was growing up, looked totally white. Inside of his heart, he was a race man. And that was a term in the early 1900s to denote black men that really had a strong and fervent desire to uplift their people. And he was a contemporary of Dr. Du Bois, so he was very much aware of the um, American Negro Academy. Um, Frederick Douglass had come to his college to speak in 1889, and he had heard him. Um, he carried around his favorite book, uh, Men of Mark, Eminent, Progressive, and Rising. It's an incredible document, 1,135 pages thick. And it's available free on the internet even now. I have the original copy of my grandfather's from 1887. And what it is, is a book of biographies and lithographic engravings of successful and well-noted black men of that time. Now, it was sexist in the sense that it didn't include black women. But from my earliest memory, people like Bishop Henry O. Turner, Henry Highland Garnett, Martin Delaney, um, Peter Clark, Alexander Crummel, of course, Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington and Du Bois, all of them were already familiar names uh, when I started school. So at least I had a sense of who I was, you know, and my grandparents, being teachers, they put their heart and soul in educating black children. Uh, I had a grandmother who taught in real rural schools, like a, one class with first through third grade, right? And because the families were very poor and ravaged by poverty and sharecroppers, oftentimes they didn't have the means 
to really put their kids together. And my grandmother would buy like 30 brushes, 30 combs, 30 toothbrushes, shoe polish, um, and hair uh, ointments and stuff, mm -hmm. and have them line up each day like this for inspection. Wow. And if they weren't totally together, she would trim their nails, brush their teeth, comb their hair. After a little while of that, the parents got to say, oh, wow, you know, on one level maybe embarrassed, but a little bit challenged, and on just a real level, helped. The kids started coming to school together, you know, spick and span. So that's the tradition that I saw with regards to black education, you know, that black teachers came first with love and then their purpose, you know what I'm saying? And that's the thing that propelled um, black people forward. And so, for instance, at the high school that my dad went to in the 30s and 40s, you had five teachers there with master's degrees even from Columbia University, which is one of the first white universities to let black people matriculate in grad school. But they had that. Black people in the South very uh, concerned and uh, eager to get educated. You know, that was one of the things that they'd been denied. And so coming from uh, a slave existence, you know, you got to remember my grandfather's mother and stepfather both had been enslaved. He himself was born just five years of slavery. So the, the stain, the pain, and the hurt of slavery still lingered uh, amongst people when I was a child, you know. And wow. um, there might have been even a few people still living who had been enslaved when I was born. So you think about that. Um, one last thing I'll mention too. When my grandfather was born, for instance, in 1870, I did some research. Right there on the census, three lines down from him was a Lucinda Holmes, age 109, birthplace, Africa. <laughs> so right there in Rising, Arkansas, in 1870, you had a woman who had been born and raised in Africa, who was pure African, a little baby boy here, three-fourths white, and they, here in America, are the same people. And so that's the mix in which I grew up in, in the South. Wow, yeah, that's a extensive, um, <clears throat> sorry, that was an extensive uh, just history and just actually knowing about your family in that, in that regard and learning that. Um, and have you always been interested in history? Well, I have to some extent, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the thing that boosted me the greatest was a gift from my mother when I was in the third grade was a set of encyclopedias. So today you have the internet. <laughs> when I was growing up, it was encyclopedias. And literally, I would start at A and just casually turning pages and read the captions under each photograph. And then I'd start with B. And I might have gone through the entire set of encyclopedias five times by the time I was in the sixth grade. Uh -huh. So I had a tremendous amount of trivia knowledge, but at the same time, um, general geographic knowledge, statistics, and things like that. And so being able to retain historical data uh, came kind of easy. And uh -huh. given the fact that I mentioned before, my granddad was so uh, enamored with these historical figures. Um, and you have to remember, I'm living with a person who's living history, so he looked mm -hmm. ancient. So, I'm, mm -hmm. so it did, and still has made me very fascinated with the past. Interesting. Uh, what are some of the lessons, I know you started to speak of a few, um, some of the lessons that you've learned from your family? Well, I guess the main thing, I would just have to say the value of education. <clears throat> and my daughter made an interesting comment that given the fact that my family on one level or another has been educated since the 1890s mm -hmm. and knowing the nature of color and class privileges 
She surmised that, wow, we should be a lot more wealthy than we are right now. What happened? And it made me think. I'm like, hmm, that is a good question. Uh, because on some levels we were positioned to be, you know, because there's some little perks and advantages in there that some people have taken advantage of. But I would like to say that it's because my family focused on education. And given the fact that both of my grandparents, all of my grandparents were very poor, they weren't thinking, I don't think, of wealth. They were thinking of having enough right. or maybe just a little bit more. And education for them was valued because education meant that you could look a white man or a white woman in the eye and speak to them on equal terms and in your heart at least know that you are of equal value. So education related more to dignity and preventing the humiliation and uh, disrespect that our people were subjected to on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I did value that. And I guess, too, the idea of working. <clears throat> you know, I saw everybody working, men, women, you know. Um, I didn't have to work as a child, but I've had a job since I was 16 years old, you know. Everybody worked. And um, work, the problem is, is that we weren't taught in terms of, investing and money and the science of money, you know. I was still brought up with the myth that if you work hard, you will get rich or you will be very materially successful. <clears throat> and that's not necessarily true. The people who work the hardest are often the poorest people in the society. And wealth has virtually nothing to do with work. Um, but I was also given a sense of faith too because my grandfather was a minister but he was also a Christian scientist, so he was an independent thinker. And that kind of led me to thinking and questioning some of the deeper aspects of the, of, of the universe and how things function. I hear that. Um, what does being black in America mean to you? Mm. Well, being black in America means to me that I'm a part of a group who struggle essentially represents the essence of what America's democracy is really trying to be about. I feel that, and I am obviously biased, but I feel that us as black people more than any group, mainly because we've on the bottom, us and American Indians, <clears throat> but I do feel even American Indians get a little bit more respect. I can't say that they're economically better off than us though. Um, but being black means that I'm a part of a group that has waged struggle that has helped everybody in this country. In that I'm a part of a group whose core culture essentially is the only original contribution American culture has made, which is basically our music. So for me, being black means I'm um, very proud of uh, being African-American. And I say that in both sense. And I tell people too that African-Americans are indigenous to the United States. And I say that because after 400 years <clears throat> of being here, we, like the Navajo, who are not originally from the Four Corners region of Arizona, who originated in Canada, but who, who, who now are there and who claim that land, are part and parcel of the Eastern Seaboard of the United States and the South. There are nowhere else where the exact combination that compose us as black people exists. Whereby you have a people who, are, while primarily African, 98% have some kind of European mi mixture, and a large percentage, not as large as we would like, but a large percentage have Native American percentage. So the uniqueness of that gives us a vantage point. And I would add this last caveat. The great uh, Sangoma, or healer of South Africa, Credo Mutwa, says that the 
body of knowledge lost by our ancestors, particularly the ones who jumped overboard in the Middle Passage, is a body of knowledge psychically and collectively that no other diasporic African people can contact but us here in the United States. Now that's his position, or us in the West actually, but particularly in the United States. And I don't know for sure if that is a concrete reality, but the metaphor rings true in my mind because when you look at it historically, our struggle has fueled not only our struggle, but liberation struggles throughout the continent, the West Indies, and the world. Many of the African leaders who went back to lead their revolutions came to study where? Here, historically black colleges. Nkrumah went to Lincoln, for instance. Uh, Marcus Garvey came here specifically to seek out Booker T. Washington. In India, even in the 60s, the untouchables, the group that is next to the lowest, they took a note from the Black Panthers and began to call themselves Dalit Panthers. You had an offshoot of the Panthers in New Zealand. So you see, and even today, if you travel, you see pictures of Tupac and Bob Marley all over the world, Muhammad Ali. So I'm very proud to be a part of a group that in many respects are seed people or people who in many respects hold the, some of the keys for uh, the future. I get that. And just around that, what are some lessons you've learned from the black community? Well, the biggest thing I would say is resilience. Mm -hmm. um, the whole phrase of two steps forward, one step backward has really been our saga, you know? It has been a wave. It hasn't been all the way up. It's been up and down. But at the same time, there's been steady progress. You see a people who have denied being put down. You push them down over here, we pop up over there. So the resiliency and the steadfastness and the, <clears throat> the depth of African culture. You have to realize that we weren't allowed to bring our formal culture to the new world in terms of language, religion, dress, even many of our foods and our festivals. We weren't allowed to do those. What we did though, when we were forced to unite during the Middle Passage, we brought our culture through that Middle Passage in our bodies. By the fact that every African had experienced to some degree or understood the power of trance states that were created in their dance and in their ceremonies. That remembrance <coughs> allowed them when they got to the new world to form new world cultural formations that started with that essential trance spirit experience. In the new world, it became known as the ring shout. And that ring shout was done away and out of sight of white people for the first 200 years. After it was observed in the 1740s, they realized that these gatherings were used in a multi-purpose way for resistance, spiritual practice, and social gathering. They started to be observed. But the experience of having spirits inhabit your body, whether it's in West Africa or in the New World, gives an individual gives that individual African a direct experience of either God or the spiritual reality. But it gives a certainty. After one has experienced something like that, they know for a fact that there is at least, what? Another dimension to life. That faith, that little kernel of truth, then spread out and forms the basis of our entire cultural experience here in America. Because from that, we create our first songs, the shout songs. We create our first dances. From those shout songs and those first dances come the spirituals, comes these jubilees, comes blues, jazz. 
And so you see, you imagine a funnel with sand, like the Wizard of, Wizard of Oz, right? Yep. You have Africa at the top, the broad base of culture that is brought down to a real narrow focal point, the middle passage where we're denied everything. And the trance experience is right there in the middle. And then once we hit the new world, it spreads out again into who we are today. What would you say are the top three things that are most harmful to the black community? There are a number. Um, but still on that list is self-hate, uh, lack of understanding who we are in the broader African sense. And at times, an unwillingness to go beyond our known parameters and seek out knowledge of the world. Um, I think those are some of the things still, just like Carter G. Woodson said, our still main barriers are mental and emotional. Now, of course, too, we still suffer from daily trauma and the historical trauma that we've experienced. Yet, we have numerous examples collectively, organizationally, movement-wise, and individually of people who've overcome. So I do feel that in many respects, the people who are on the bottom, they hold the secrets because if they rise up, things change for everybody. So at this point, I feel like between us, Native Americans, Mexicans and brown people and immigrants, the disabled, all of us have a stock, poor white people, Conscious white people, you know, um, I kind of agree with sub uh, Comandante Marcos of the uh, Zapatistas. Um, it's us versus them, and us is like ninety-eight percent. And so, I'm still encouraged. I feel that any program, though today, that a black organization has must include some analysis on climate change because climate change is the one thing that is going to unite all the peoples of the world, otherwise we will perish. So I think there's a lot of things facing us that um, if we continue to use the ingenuity and creativity and resourcefulness that we've shown, we'll be okay. Um, it sounds like in part of your answer around that in terms of fixing things was in terms of uniting around like, class issues, you know, rather than, you know, just obviously around color lines right. and things of that no, nature. No, no question. Yeah. Um, capitalism is a big enemy. It's not just race. You have class, you have race, and we got to deal with the gender issues. The issues of trans and gay people are not going to go away. And so black people have to embrace, and we've always had an ambivalent embrace of everybody. Everybody in a black family knows somebody in their family that was gay. It wasn't openly talked about, but for the most part, people were accepted. But they couldn't really be themselves. So we have to get to where we can embrace all of who we are and accept some of the leadership from some of our young queer women leaders now who are doing the bulk of the scholarly and intellectual weightlifting amongst our people right now. I hear that. What would you say you are most proud of? I would say I'm most proud of my family. I grew up as an only child, so I've been able to raise, um, help raise four adult children, um, three of which have finished school, and finished college and two of which have advanced degrees and all of which are doing uh, things that are meaningful to them and making a difference. So I'm most proud of them and uh, my little grandson. I guess after that I would say I'm just to some extent I'm proud of the fact that I've been able to <clears throat> have the courage and the support to try to carve out my own life mm -hmm. and do it my way. I don't say that arrogantly, 
Um, but I say it with gratitude that I've been able to work for myself for over 30 years. I've been able to have a balance between two professions, teaching and healing, that have allowed me to, at least in some small measure, help people. So at this juncture in my life, which I figure is the beginning, I'm hoping of the third quarter, of the fourth quarter, I mean, um, I can kind of up that a little bit, hone in a little bit more on my spiritual practices, try to really embrace what being an elder means. At the same time, not take up too much space or more space than necessary. You know, it is sometimes as elders, we can really get into our ego and think that, you know, we have what we have to say is more important. I don't feel that way, but I do know it is as important. And so, you know, just trying to get that balance uh, at this point um, and, and see, achieve, you know, some last things that I want to do, some travel, see some different ways of living uh, and writing, you know, so I'm, I'm heavily encouraged. And of course, health, it, it all comes down to health, you know, and so I'm trying to stay healthy and uh, follow other role models of health. You know, we have elders in our group that are older than us who I admire a great deal. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm trying to follow in their footsteps. I hear that. What would be some advice you'd give to your younger self? Stay the course. Follow your intuition. Dig deep. Ask the big questions like you did. Mm -hmm. I, for the most part, agree with my younger self. I mean, if there's anything, I probably would say travel a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm overall kind of satisfied with the decisions that I made because I felt that I took the courageous stand at the time to, to take my life back. I jumped off the track that I had been put on or um, programmed on and did it in a way that I felt comfortable. So I, I feel very grateful that I've been allowed to do that more than anything. Um, I would probably just say that, you know, Pay closer attention to the aging process of your parents. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, if there's any one thing I would say, I would, I would say that. Interesting. Because they turn a corner at a certain point where they need help. And they're not going to tell you that they've turned a corner because sometimes they don't even know it themselves. Mm -hmm. And if you're not tuned in, you can miss it. So that's what I would tell myself and any young person, that while you're living your life and enjoying your life, of course you know that you have a window, say between 20 and 40 maybe, where you can focus on you. But soon there comes a point where you need to focus a little bit on your parents more and their care. No, that's, that's certainly important. Um, and the experiences, I guess, that you have around that, too, as you get older, you can see the patterns, you know, and recognize when something's going off that pattern, yeah. you know, diverting from That's there. That's right. Or as well. So now, like you said, now paying attention makes, makes all the... You but know, it requires you to stop being so self-absorbed. Mm. And as young people, we have a tendency to really be focusing on ourselves. Yeah. And that's the only thing I would say, you know, focus a little bit more on your parents. I hear that. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier about... Um, wanting to travel more, or gain some time to do that. Uh, what are some places you've traveled to, and where do you hope to travel? Well, as of yet, I've been all over the United States, of course, and lived all in different lot of places in the South, in Mexico and Canada, but I've yet to leave, I've yet to leave the Western Hemisphere. So oh, okay. uh, this summer, I actually have a trip planned for Ghana. Oh, very and, nice. Um, so the places that are on the top of the list right now are Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, and India. Wow. Uh, I've always had a strong pull toward India, so mm -hmm. um, I hope to be able to do that in the next couple of years, inshallah. That sounds, that sounds oh, and you, I, mean, I believe you mentioned earlier around meditation and things too, was that, was that part of uh, 
your process from, in terms of being, feeling like you feel some connection with India or was it just? Well, you know, I've uh, tried to follow, um, just like I've had two professions, I've kind of had two spiritual paths to mm -hmm. some extent, uh, somewhere between yoga and Sufism. Okay. Um, I was introduced to yoga first and I've had several teachers, but primarily my main instruction in yoga has come through reading, you know, Swami mm -hmm. Vivekananda and uh, Sri Ramakrishna, both who helped revolutionize India's spiritual process and kind of inspired Gandhi even later on. Um, and then my other spiritual pursuit has been in Sufism. And mm -hmm. Sufism has allowed me to have a context whereby you can at least try to have a spiritual practice with a family. Yoga often is kind of a monastic pursuit. And so in many respects, even though I'm attracted to it philosophically, practically, I didn't know if I could do it. Mm -hmm. But Sufism, which is the mystical aspect of Islam, and it essentially is about remembrance. Both of those two paths are essentially recognizing that there's something inside of us that is connected to everything else that is in the universe. And that we come from that, and at some point we're gonna to return to that. And the degree to which you can understand that and realize that in your life, you can bring in a level of peace and healing and clarity and acceptance that is hard to attain otherwise. Mm -hmm. Wow. No, that's, that's, uh, that's powerful. Um, I'm just going to uh, switch gears a little bit. How did you get involved with the Brotherhood of Elders Network? Well, um, first off, I was in a, a group about 10 years before we started the Brotherhood of Elders Network mm -hmm. that myself and a brother named uh, Pedro Noguera started. Mm -hmm. And in that group was Baba Arnold, Greg, and several other members. Um, and so we met for years doing that. And from there, Baba Arnold, for several years, started a mentorship program where we would invite younger people, particularly like Greg and Sean Jenright, and essentially grooming them for leadership. Then he began to walk, and in the walks around the lake, he, uh, I think, Robert Powell um, and Woody Carter came up with the idea to form a group, particularly at that time of elders. And so they began to meet, and Greg facilitated a meeting of them, I think in 2010. Out of that meeting came a charge to form a group of younger men in my age group. And Greg called me and I called several people. He primarily and Sean, but then myself additionally called people that we knew to form the middle group. And then we had a retreat in 2011 and gave the charge to form the group that you're in, the Warriors. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, this started 2009, 2010, 2011. And then in 2011, the entire group met for the first time at the Marconi Center. And it was just born out of everybody's had past experiences. You have to realize that people like Barbara Arnold, uh, Barbara Cole, Barbara Joe, they're past veterans of civil rights and black power movements. Mm -hmm. uh, Baba Joe had been in the Republic of New Africa. Uh, Baba Arnold had been in ODAC, Oakland Direct Action Committee. Actually, they had done the patrols before the Black Panthers. Baba Cole had been in SNCC. Baba Gerald had been a Panther. Um, you have Baba Wade Knowles, who's like the founder of black psychology. So you had all these individuals and in our midst, even myself, I had belonged to, a, I caught the tail end of that group where I was a member of a Pan-African and Socialist group in New Orleans called the Hediana. And we were in association with Karinga's group in Southern California, Institute of Positive Education in Chicago, headed by Haki Mahabuti, and the East run by G2 Wayusi in New York. 
And so you have all these individuals bringing these past experiences. You know, Baba Greg Harge had been instrumental in Wose Community Church, uh, grassroots African Senate Church for over 30 years. So you have all these people coming with various experiences and that's what formed the Brotherhood of Elders Network and the idea of it being an intergenerational group of black men, um, we didn't really know how unique that actually was but it has turned out to be kind of a unique formula and uh, we've gone on from there. How has the Brotherhood of Elders Network impacted your life? Well, it has given me another outlet. I've always tried to have um, an individual creative thing going, my own business, mm -hmm. but then some type of community network that I've been involved in. And so in that context, it still gives me an outlet to interact um, with younger brothers like yourself and mm -hmm. older men. Um, it really initially, to be quite honest, it was, I went socially because I made sure that all of my closest friends were in it because you'll see this as you get older, you'd have less time for your friends. And so for me, it provided a built in mechanism to see my, some of my closest friends, you know, like Greg, Greg and I are from the same hometown. So I've known him for over 50 years. And you knew and him? I knew him, I knew him when he was little. Yeah. Okay. okay. I went to school with his big sister, you know, and he was outstanding then. My, gra mm -hmm. my dad taught him in sixth grade. Even, oh, wow. You know, I used to grade his papers. So I knew that he was outstanding from mm -hmm. day one. And so we hooked up out here in 82 and been in each other's lives, raising our kids together the whole time, you know. And then there's people like Howard Pendehues. I've known him for 40 years. Um, so it has been helpful on a number of levels. Um, yeah. No, that's, that's amazing. Um, what advice would you give the next generation, younger generation? Be true to yourself. Um, get your proper education out of the way as soon as possible and get as much as you can. Okay. I'm not from the view of, you know, the, white man's education is not useful. No, education is very useful because it gives you, first off, certification in which you can do certain things, you can move easier, um, and you can maneuver. It gives you a vantage point and a power base, mm -hmm. and it gives you a network. So that's one of the things I would say. Be true to yourself, mm -hmm. get your proper training, and then go for it. You know, don't settle for just a job. If the job fits into the context of your life's purpose and your life's work, fine. But have a larger view of what your life's purpose is about. Then what kind of work? Young men and young women today are gonna to have three to five careers. The day is over where you settle in on any one particular job or career. Even myself, I'm on a third career now. I've been a teacher. I taught upward bound for 32 years, and I juggled that with being in chiropractic practice for 32 years. And for the last six years, I've started a consultant practice. So be open to how life is wanting you to grow mm -hmm. and expand. And then be curious. Never stop learning. Um, challenge yourself. Write. Speak, develop all of your skills. Pay close attention to what you eat, okay? Years ago, when we got into the movement, almost all of us were vegetarians. You know, we, we were trying to deal with a holistic perspective, you know? In fact, I had a, we had a magazine called Foresight, a holistic view of African-American struggles that I edited um, from 81 to 83. You don't see people as interested in their diet as much these days. People know about the diet, but what people do is all kinds of stuff, and it still makes a big difference. And so I would tell a young person to just really be true to themselves and not give in to mediocrity. Challenge yourself 
for excellence. May not get there, but at least challenge yourself. And of course, be clear about your money, uh, which is something that really my generation, we weren't, we were kind of anti-money at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had to, but you do need money. And I really encourage people to look at it collectively, form cooperatives. But that doesn't mean we don't make money. You just want everybody to have some money. Yeah. And we want everybody to be prosperous. Um, so these are some of the things. And pay close attention to your family. You know? Um, some of the old values I still stand by. You know? Mm -hmm. If you're a brother and you got kids, take care of your kids. Simple as that. See them. Spend money on them. Take care of them. Provide for them. Relationships. They're a whole nother order. I'm not going to try to posit and give out no knowledge on that. Um, but parenting, that's, you got to do that. And so some of the old stuff still works, you know, responsibility, you know, accountability, showing up. Like you, like your, like your brothers in your group, you know, y'all got the message. You know, from somebody. So somebody's doing their work. I hear that. I appreciate it. Is there uh, anything else uh, we haven't covered that you would like to talk about? Well, I guess the last thing I would just like to say is that we want to embrace the future. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we are afraid of the future because mm -hmm. Black people, when we look at futurist movies, we don't see ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I want us to not only embrace the future, but think about how we can make the future better. Mm -hmm. Read the work of Octavia Butler. Read some of our futurists. Understand what the emergent technology represents. How does the new technology, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, uh, synthetic biology, how does all of that relate to climate change? And how does that whole conundrum relate to your spiritual development? For me, these are some of the big questions that not only other people, but black people should be entertaining too. We don't want to just keep our minds only focusing on black on black violence and police violence. We want to understand that, but we also have want to give ourselves room to think about what would a black utopia look like? What would a utopia that is from a black perspective yet includes all the peoples of the world look like? Those are some of the things I would like to share. Um. Well, Barbara Quayle, thank you so much for spending your time with us today. We really appreciate you coming here and sharing and imparting your wisdom with us, especially for this uh, oral history project. It's so important, and we're lucky to have you. Thank you. Ashe.